I'm going to be ah, yes, recording. Okay, I'm going to be talking about um, two open problems, um, neither of which is solved, <laughs> um, but some progress in that direction that is all joint with Ty Lidman, Claudius Brovius, Artem Katelsky, and Liam Watson, who I think many of you know. Um, so I'm going to uh, go over uh, a lot of kind of background stuff first. And I want to talk first about knots and tangle decompositions um, as a kind of warm up. So uh, let's see, knots and tangles. So I'm going to assume that I have a knot in S3. And uh, I can always write my knot K using a tangle decomposition. So I could write it as a sum T1 union T2 um, over S. And by T, what I mean here is that T is, um, T is really a pair of a ball the three ball and the two properly embedded arcs. This isn't the only type of tangle I could consider. And if I have a link, I might need to consider some closed components, but for what I'm saying today, I can assume I've got no closed components, I'm basically just dealing with knots. Um, now it may not be a very interesting tangle decomposition. I could just take the neighborhood of a crossing for one of the tangles. And so I can kind of describe my knot in terms of this tangle decomposition or draw a picture like this. And sometimes this is also called uh, the numerator closure of a tangle sum. That's other common notation for this. T1 plus T2, this horizontal tangle sum and numerator closure. Um, so the boundary of this ball is, is, is a sphere. And uh, this intersects the knot transversely in four points, creating a four punctured sphere. And I want to make the kind of observation, warm up observation, that if you're trying to um, do some knot theory, I guess, that tangled decompositions can be really helpful. So in particular, uh, as an example of this, you can use tangled decompositions to sometimes effectively calculate a Jones polynomial. So if I were going to do that and calculate a Jones polynomial using a breakdown like what's in this picture, well, let me jot down my Jones polynomial first. So I have a polynomial um, in a variable t, um, or maybe t, I could reparameterize it as a variable a. And this is something I could obtain in lots of different ways, but I could obtain it from like a normalized bracket polynomial. That's what x stands for. Another polynomial um, in a, which I get from taking uh, the Kaufman bracket and then correcting by the rise of the diagram. So I have some multiplier out front that does that correction. And here's my um, Kaufman bracket. And um, as you all probably know, with the Kaufman bracket, you, you carry out a recursion to figure this out. And that recursion is based off of um, three axioms. Let me scale this down and I'll jot it on the same page. So for here, I would use um, the rules like that the unknot gets one, that if I have a disjoint union with some diagram, that's delta times the bracket of the diagram, and then the recursion law, that if I have a crossing, I can resolve it as um, A times a horizontal resolution plus A inverse vertical resolution, something like this, okay? And so that gives me a way to calculate this Jones polynomial. But I could also apply this recursion to a tangle. It doesn't have to be a knot. Um, and if I apply that recursion to a tangle, I'm going to get what I call the bracket vector of t. So in particular, that bracket vector of a tangle t is going to look like um, some polynomial in A, that's f, and some polynomial in g. But I can't resolve the zero resolution or the infinity resolution. So I'm going to have a, a kind of vector-like expression like this. So ft and gt are polynomials, Laurent polynomials. And now that's what it is for a tangle. So if I want to go and calculate the numerator closure of two tangles, and that's a link, and to calculate the uh, bracket vector of that link, then I can use my tangle decomposition and see that this is the evaluation of some bilinear form. So I have the bracket vector for T1, and I pair it with the bracket vector for T2. Um, 
and I use a matrix that looks like this. And that'll calculate for me the Kaufman bracket of the closed link that I get from putting these tangles together. And it's, it's nice and it's convenient because this is symmetric. So if I wanna do something like prove the Jones polynomial is invariant under mutation, um, it's super easy to do with this perspective if it's a symmetric form. Um, okay, so I wanna kind of take this general strategy as motivation, um, this, this, this pairing strategy. And I also wanna look at some problems in knot theory with this strategy, but we need to kind of bump up the complexity level a little bit. So instead of taking the bracket polynomial, um, what we're gonna be considering instead um, is reduced Kavanaugh homology. Um, and instead of taking the pairing using this pairing I've just described where we have the bracket vector of T1 and the bracket vector of T2 paired with this symmetric form, um, we're gonna be considering a different kind of pairing, an intersection pairing, a sort of intersection pairing. Um, but what's really going to be um, a version of Lagrangian floor homology of curves on a punctured sphere. All right, that's kind of the basic idea. And this is this all is building upon um, work of Barnaton and Katelsky, Watson, and Zabrobius. Okay. Uh, so let me say a few more words about about um, background on the types of problems that we're gonna be considering. All right, so let me talk a little bit about Dane surgery. Okay, Dane surgery is this fundamental cutting and pasting operation that we do on three manifolds. So you have a knot, I'll just draw a trefoil, a messy trefoil, and you take a neighborhood of your knot, make my neighborhood a little bit blue. Okay, so I remove a neighborhood of this knot. And then what I'm going to do is glue back in a solid torus. Let's call this solid torus V with meridian mu V. So I'm taking the union of the complement of the neighborhood of the knot and V, gluing over a map H, and this map H is going to identify the meridian of the solid torus with a curve, P mu plus Q lambda. This is a different mu. This is in some um, basis of the torus that I'm identifying it to. Um, and so the parameters P and Q determine how this surgery is going to work. And so P over Q is sometimes called a slope. And I'll often denote this with R for a rational surgery slope. And so this gives us a different three manifold and there's lots of familiar examples of these. So here's a few familiar examples. So um, we could take P, Q surgery on the unknot, and that's gonna give you a lens space LPQ. Um, or you might wanna correct me with the sign, and I never understand how the sign works, but I, I'll just say LPQ for now. Um, you can take plus one surgery on the right-handed trefoil. And if you do that, you're gonna get um, the Poincaré homology sphere. Of course, you could do surgery on a link as well. So if you also wanted to get the get um, something like the Poincaré homology sphere, you can take plus one plus one surgery on the whitehead link. Here's the whitehead link. If you mix up your surgery coefficients and you take plus one minus one surgery, um, you get a trefoil, right-handed trefoil, but then you're doing minus one surgery on it. So you're gonna get a different rescorn sphere, sigma two, three, seven. And, um, it's not like a unique construction in any way. If you take five surgery on the right-handed trefoil, perhaps it's minus five surgery, you get the lens space L51. And you can also get that by doing five surgery on the unknot. So it's not unique, um, but it is a significant construction and it is a universal construction. So this is a, a cutting and pasting operation. So it's really good for things that you're gonna be doing with cutting and pasting type strategies. So like if you were going to calculate homology using the Meyer via torus sequence, it would work well for that. Um, and it's universal in the sense that we have the Likerish and Wallace theorem. Likerish comma Wallace. Uh, 
which says that every closed and oriented three manifold is obtained by surgery on some link. perhaps of many components. Okay, so we're interested in this operation of Dane surgery. Okay, so let me now present to you two conjectures. All right, in the kind of um, world of Dane surgery. Two problems, both of which are still open. Okay. So the first is the cosmetic surgery conjecture. This conjecture is due to Cameron Gordon, my advisor. Um, and the statement is that if you do R surgery along a knot K in S3, and the manifold that you get is orientation preserving homeomorphic to R prime surgery along K, um, then these slopes had to be the same. R prime is equal to R. And um, a, a cosmetic surgery is these surgeries that produce the same the same three manifolds. So this would be a, the existence of this cosmetic surgery. Well, it's not supposed to exist. Um, the second statement is uh, at, at, at face value is not related to Dane surgery. It's just a statement about knots or not diagrams. And that's a cosmetic crossing conjecture. Um, this statement is um, due to Lynn from roughly the 90s, although nobody seems to know the, the first appearance of this statement. I suspect it's the kind of thing that people um, assumed to be true for a long time and then realized that possibly it might not be true. Um, and that's the statement that if you do a crossing change to a knot, um, it's going to turn it into a different knot, unless that crossing was what's called nugatory. So a crossing, change such that k plus is isotopic to k minus must occur at a nugatory crossing, which is the silly way where you would change a crossing and preserve the isotopy type of the knot. I'll, I'll draw an example of a nugatory crossing. OK, so um, your right Meister one moves are examples of nugatory crossings, or you could like tie in um, some knot here. I hope I didn't just tie in a link. Um, let's put an odd number of crossings in there. Um, so here's an example of a, a, a nugatory crossing would be right here in the middle. You can just kind of flip it out. All right. So these are the two um, open problems. And there is a lot of progress that has been made on, made on them. And we'll also see how um, the second one is related to the first in some context. Okay. All right, so I have, um, I'm gonna put, put up a history slide now and mention some of the progress that's been made. Uh, and there's a lot, too much to actually mention all, all here, but I'll, I'll say some of the highlights. Lots of progress. Okay, so we'll have the cosmetic surgery column and we'll have the cosmetic crossing change column over here. <laughs> okay, so, um, the history of the cosmetic surgery crossing kicks off um, with Gordon Lukey's article, Knots Are Determined by Their Complements from 1989. Um, so we've got Gordon and Lukey's theorem. Actually, they, they have a, the theorem statement is that if you're doing R surgery um, along K and you don't get S3 um, for R not equal to um, infinity surgery, then K is not equal to the un knot. So if you have a non-trivial surgery on a non-trivial slope, you get a non-trivial knot. And so in particular, this is like the cosmetic surgery conjecture when R is equal to infinity. Um, S3 here is infinity surgery on your knot. So this is S3 infinity 
um, surgery along uh, K. So this is basically answering it for R equals infinity. Um, there are uh, obstructions um, due to Boyer and lines that are phrased in terms um, or can be phrased in terms of uh, the second derivative of the Conway polynomial of a knot evaluated at one, which I think is sometimes called the Casson invariant of a knot. And Boyer's here. So if there's questions about that, you know where to direct them. <laughs> um, there's also uh, lots of progress that's been made in the world of Haggard fluoromology due to um, Ojvath and Sabo, um, due to Ni and Wu, and due to um, Wang. Okay, and um, all of this uses different aspects of floor homology. So it might use um, the torsion part of floor homology, um, the, the, in, the gradings of floor homology, the D invariants, um, the rank, other aspects of it. But um, somehow the strongest result to date on the cosmetic surgery conjecture um, is due to Hanselman. Hanselman combines a lot of these things including previous work of others. And Hanselman's statement says that if, um, if you're doing our surgery along K and you're getting something orientation preserving homeomorphic to R prime surgery along K, um, then you know a lot about the slopes. Then um, R is minus R um, prime. And you have two cases to consider basically. The first case is that R is plus or minus two. For the second case is that R is plus or minus one over Q. And that really kind of narrows it down. Um, this part of it, the R equals minus R prime, this part's um, in work of Nian Wu. But this case analysis is coming out of Hanselman. Okay. Um, we also have a similarly long history of the cosmetic crossing conjecture, which um, I'll just say just a few words about, mainly to rattle off the kinds of knots on which it is known to be true. So Charlemagne and Thompson, um, they tell you that this is true for the unknot, not like directly, but it's implicit in their work. Um, Tori Sue worked it out for two bridge knots. Calfagiani and, and um, independently um, Rogers have it worked out for fibered knots. And then um, Baum, Friedel, Calfagiani, and Powell, and Ito have looked at different genus one knots. I'm just abbreviating people's names here because it's a lot of names to write down, but I'd be happy to send out references to people if they're interested. Um, and then um, uh, Ty Lindman and myself worked this out for um, many classes of alternating, quasi-alternating, and thin knots. Um, um, knots whose branch double covers are L spaces. And then we can also um, add uh, recent work of uh, Joshua Wang to the list. This is a different Wang than the Wang of the, of the li list on the left. Um, and so um, he's looking at a generalized cosmetic crossing conjecture and banding split links. And I kind of want to point out that um, Wang's result over here uses Kavanaugh homology in a way, but on this list on the left, there's um, no results really that use Kavanaugh homology at all. There's no, no appearance of that in any of these strategies that I know of. So um, I'm gonna tell you about a result that kind of tries to contribute to the list on the left using Kavanaugh homology. And I'll add as a kind of um, passing remark that the orientation part here is, a, is an important consideration um, in the cosmetic surgery conjecture. There are examples of Taurus knots that admit chirally cosmetic surgeries. And you can find this in work of Ichihara, Ito, and Saito. And we also had a, a nice talk last week or two weeks ago at VCU by Constantinos Barbarezos, who told us um, about some of the work on the front of chirally cosmetic surgeries. All right, so what can we now contribute um, to this list? Well, here's a theorem statement. Call this um. Theorem one. Um, 
Um, so we're going to let um, K, really KH, be a non trivial, strongly invertible knot. If um, the two slopes are in R prime, uh, technically these are rational numbers or infinity, are slopes such that we have the orientation preserving homeomorphism, but we need to add in one extra thing, such that these are orientation preserving homeomorphic and uh, the, the um, the involution of the strongly invertible knot um, behaves nicely with respect to the homeomorphism. So HR prime composed with F is F composed with HR. I'll explain that in a moment. Then we can conclude that R is equal to R prime. Okay. So this statement that we have here is essentially a Z2 equivariant cosmetic surgery conjecture. That's how I might summarize it. Okay, we are looking at knots that have a particular kind of symmetry um, and answering this conjecture for that class of knots. So I wanna tell you what strongly invertible knots are. Um, okay, since that's in the statement of um, the theorem. All right, so let me draw a picture of a strongly invertible knot down here. I'll just draw a pretzel knot because they're easy to draw. Okay, so this knot has um, what's called a strong inversion. So uh, that is going to be a map H, um, which goes from S3 to S3. It's a map on the whole space that takes K to K. Um, and it intersects, the axis of the involution intersects the knot in two points. So let me draw one, one such um, axis right here. Okay, so here is um, where the involution is happening and it intersects the knot in exactly two points. Okay, I'll add as a comment here that this isn't the only involution that this knot has. There could be more than one. There's another involution that acts right here. You know, it misses the knot kind of, it goes through this crossing and then this purple axis intersects it here and here and then goes through the other crossing. Um, okay, so we have a sort of H prime over here as well. Well, maybe I shouldn't use prime. I should call them like one and two to not confuse with the notation of the theorem, but there's just another involution in this picture. Um, okay, so this involution H um, on S3 restricts to the elliptic involution on the boundary of the neighborhood of the knot. So you have, um, you're not going around like this and here's my involution restricted um, to the boundary of the neighborhood of the knot, giving me four fixed points here. That's the elliptic involution on the torus. And because of this, um, you can show that H extends uh, uniquely to an involution on surgery on the knot. So that's kind of um, written down in work of Holzer, I guess. And it's also um, written down in a, a nice exposition by Ockley. Um, so H extends Um, uniquely to HR on the surgery. So we're taking a strongly invertible knot. And then when we have this HR that shows up in the statement of the theorem, that means the involution extended to the surgery. And it's that that we want to be compatible with the orientation preserving homeomorphism. So this theorem that we're going to get to is really just a consequence of, a, of, a, of another theorem that we're going to prove that's more in the language not, uh, knots and tangles. So theorem one follows from uh, really three things. One is how we go from surgery um, to tangles, and that's going to be the Montesinos trick. which I'll also say more about in a moment, but um, for now, let me just comment that this is going to be how 
um, we make a correspondence between rational tangle replacements in knots and um, rational vein surgery in the branch double cover of the knot. The second item that we're going to need is uh, uh, Hanselman's case analysis. So the result of Hanselman that says, in terms of surgery slopes, um, we really only need to consider two cases. The case that R is plus or minus two, and the case that R is plus or minus one over Q. Um, and then the third thing is what I'm about to tell you about theorem number two, uh, which I'll state on the next slide. All right. Okay. Actually, I've got room to state it down here, so I will <laughs> make some space for it. Okay, so um, here's theorem number two. So let's let, tank, let's let T be a tangle with an unknot closure. Um, if T, I should probably explain this notation, but if the tangle filling T R is isotopic to the tangle filling T R prime, then either R is equal to R prime or T was rational. Okay, so um, this is the statement that we wanna show. Let me, um, explain the notation T of R, um, rational closure and unknot closure. Okay, it's a little bit of an unfortunate kind of recycling of terminology. So when I say T is a tangle with an unknot closure, what I mean is I have some sort of tangle, like here's one, I'll take this pretzel tangle, um, two, um, three. So here's a pretzel tangle, okay. And I could close this up in such a way that I get an unknot by taking um, this closure. This all untwists and becomes an unknot. So I would say that this is T. What I'm actually what I'm actually pairing it with or filling it with is a zero, um, a zero tangle, and this is equal to an unknot. So that's what I mean by unknot closure here. Sometimes you might say rational closure, but what you really mean is rational filling. So this notation here, T R, means that I'm taking a tangle. I'm taking the horizontal sum with a rational tangle of slope R. And then I'm taking the numerator closure of that. So tangle, um, some, some sort of rational tangle, like you know, one over three or zero or infinity or something more complicated. And that's T T R. Okay, so that's um, the statement. All right. Um, so uh, we, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, we're gonna basically use the Monacinos trick to go between the theorem statements. So how does the Monacinos trick look in this context? Or how does our up, upstairs, downstairs stairwell look in this context? <laughs> okay, so um, the notion is we have this uh, not complement. Okay, um, and we are going to be Kind of going to three ball. Let me draw a picture over here. Um, actually, let me draw a strongly invertible knot. Um, yes, uh, actually, let me, erase. let me erase what I just wrote and just draw a picture. So here is some strongly invertible knot with fewer crossings than the one that I drew before. All right, the axis of involution is here, passes through the knot, hits it twice, and it keeps going. Okay. Um, so the thing is, the fixed set 
of H um, intersect a boundary of the neighborhood of the knot is four points. Right, we can kind of see that here. If I if I were to start to draw in the neighborhood of the knot, um, that would look like this. That would look like this going through. Um, and you can see that intersection, um, one, two, three, four. That's kind of um, on either side of the red dots that I drew. So here, 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 and what would be here. Um, okay. And um, as a consequence of um, the Smith conjecture, which is a theorem, not due to Smith, um, <laughs> uh, the, fix, the fixed set of, of H is in a knot. Not, not a not not. Okay. And um, when we project downstairs um, under this um, involution, what we're going to see is that this neighborhood of the knot becomes a ball. All right. So the quotient is a ball. Uh, which I can sort of draw for this picture. It's a little bit a little bit can be a little bit sloppy, but it's going to look like this. I'll put the axis back in in a moment. Okay, and where the axis went was here, intersection, 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 intersection. This is kind of connected by an arc, um, and this goes behind, and then this goes over based on the sign of the crossing and the, which became the sign of the class and so this was the this was the axis okay this was the fixed set so it's still it's still an unknot and now if i take um if i take this area on the outside what i see is i have two arcs that are properly embedded in a three ball and that's a tangle so this is in red these two arcs are the tangle when i turn this picture inside out all right and the point is that um, when I'm doing P over Q surgery along K, that's gonna correspond to a rational tangle filling of T. Okay. Um, okay. And in particular, if a tangle T, um, if a tangle filling of T gives me the unknot, then that filling is rational. And we can see this in the branch double cover as a rational Dane surgery along the strongly invertible knot. Um, we are surgering all along the lift of the arc that is dual to the separating disc of the rational tangle. Um, I don't know if I should draw a picture of this or of what I just said, but um, given a rational tangle, um, say like this, I have some sort of separating disc like this. And then I have this dual arc here. This is going to lift upstairs. If this is gamma, this lifts upstairs to strongly invertible knot K H. Okay. So um, now let's get to the strategy for proving theorem two. Theorem two says that I'm going to be considering tangles with unknot closures, and I am going to look at tangle fillings with rational, um, rational tangles. All right, so uh, how this theorem is proved is by using uh, immersed curves for tangles. What do I mean by that? That's kind of a slogan, and that is um, basically the title of a paper um, by Katalski. Watson and Zabrovius. And what they have worked out is this um, amazing program for creating a geometric realization of the tangle invariants for Kavanov homology that are due to Barnaton. So what they what they have is um, invariants that they denote Bn for Barnaton tangle invariant and Kh for Kavanov tangle invariant. 
Um, and what these are, are um, decorated, meaning there's some gratings associated with them, sets of immersed curves, on a four punctured sphere that realize Barnaton's tangle invariant, which is a, a, a type of Kavanov-esque tangle invariant. Here's what a picture of one of these tangle invariants looks like when you produce it as an immersed curve. Um, here's my four punctured sphere, and one of the punctures has been de designated as special. And I parameterize it with some little gray arcs. Um, there's going to be some labels on here that out of context probably don't mean anything. But I'll put on, include the labels for now. Anyway, um, what, what the tangle invariant looks like for, say, the Kavanov tangle invariant for the infinity tangle is going to be a, an immersed curve that looks like this. And it intersects this parameterization in these two points. Okay. Um, so what this curve uh, is realizing is a particular chain complex. And that chain complex well, um, I'm going to cryptically denote with dots and, and arrows, but there's a chain complex that's associated with this curve uh, that looks sort of like this, which is called um, that of T. So we'll call this immersed curve, like say alpha. Okay. So that's that's what it looks like for this in, infinity um, tangle. Um, we can draw another one. Let's say for a, a three twist. There, there are two versions of these tangles. There's the kind of Kavanov tangle invariant and the Barnaton tangle invariant. So we'll do the Barnaton tangle invariant for the other one. Okay, so um, we, we again have this four punctured sphere. I'll try to draw a more quickly this time. Parameterization. And the chain complex that we're going to be realizing has more maps in it. This is gonna be for the, um, probably getting the signs of the crossings wrong, but a three twist uh, or maybe the mirror of this. And so the Barnaton invariant for this is going to look like uh, another kind of curve. This one happens to be embedded. Uh, and it intersects both of these parameter parameterization arcs. Um, and there's three points here, okay. And so um, you can kind of sort of um, see from the picture that the path that's being traced out by this curve is telling you about the maps in the chain complex. Um, there is the same kind of S and D arrows in this picture um, going around. So you think about this as being, as being associated with um, S, the, a map labeled D, a map labeled S, and a map labeled D. And so this kind of, say, for example, this kind of piece of the immersed curve that goes from this intersection to, oh, sorry, there's four intersections of this one, to this intersection. This is homotopic um, to D, to this arc labeled D. And uh, you see that here as kind of representing this chunk of the chain complex. All right, we'll call this immersed curve beta for the sake of this example. And we'll say this is, um, we'll say this is like A and this one is B. All righty. So the notion is that this is kind of coming out of Barnaton's perspective. So Barnaton um, defined a tangle invariant uh, bracket T mod L, which is a chain complex modulo some local relations uh, over a cabordism category. Uh, Chain complex over cabordism category. 
Um, and what Katelsky, Watson, and Zabrovius did is they made an association between um, some subcategory of the Kabordism category. and um, a path algebra over a quiver um, where, the, where the arrows in the quiver are labeled by D and S. One of these should be white and one of these should be black. Okay. Modulo some relations, um, DS equals zero and SD equals zero. So um, they also associated Barnatons invariant, which is a chain complex over this thing with um, a type D structure, which is kind of similar to the type D structures that you see in bordered floor um, And uh, that's what this debt is, is type D structure. All right, and the, the thing about this theory is it's not just like a way of translating one picture into another. It's that it gives you a really hands-on method for calculating Kavanaugh homology using a pairing theorem, the pairing strategy that I tried to motivate at the beginning with the Jones polynomial. Um, that's what you can see out of this picture. So their pairing theorem, says that if you want to calculate the reduced Kavanaugh homology of a link, you can calculate it from two tangle. You get a tangle decomposition of your link, and then you're going to calculate the Lagrangian floor homology of the immersed curves that realize the tangle invariance of the two pieces. So that's this statement. You have to take the Barnaton invariant of one of them and you have to take the Kavanov invariant of the other, which turns out to be like a, the Kavanov invariant is a mapping cone of the Barnaton invariant. And you have to mirror one of them. But you have this statement that says, here's a way that I can calculate Kavanov homology. So if we wanna use the same examples from up here. Um, so this gave, us, uh, this gave us a three twist and an infinity twist. So if we put these two tangles together, we're gonna get a trefoil knot, right? So Here's the three twist and here's the um, infinity twist. And so there's my tangle decomposition looks like this. These have been spliced together. All right. So um, if I wanna calculate the, the Kavanaugh homology out of this, that means I'm gonna be superimposing this picture over this picture and counting intersection points. So let me do that down here. Take my drawing and I'm going to make a third drawing that combines that combines the two of them. Let me borrow my chain map, my chain complex too. Okay. All right, so um living that cut and paste lifestyle right now. <laughs> okay. So um, here I have my blue curve and my red curve together, and that's gonna look like this. Um, it's going to intersect, um, it's going to intersect here, uh, it's going to come down and around, it's going to intersect, oops, I didn't like that, boom, okay, so up to homotopy, that's alpha and beta together, and we can at least, we can't really make too much sense of this picture yet, but um, we can at least see that there are th three places where the blue and red curves intersect, which I'll, I'll color purple here, here, and here. So if you're taking, um, if you're taking the intersection homology of these immersed curves, you're gonna get something of rank three. And that's at least consistent with our expectation of the numbers that we associate with the trefoil knot. So this was supposed to be calculating the reduced Kavanaugh homology of the trefoil knot. And at the very least, we're seeing that we get something that is rank three out of this calculation. All right, so um, the pictures are, are really lovely, um, but in terms of practical matters, um, if you weren't calculating this from um, Lagrangian floor homology, what would you be doing to calculate the Kavanaugh homology of this link? Well, 
you'd be having to take the homology of a HOM complex. And I don't know about y'all's personal taste, but I find that to be very difficult to carry out by hand. So um, here we have some sort of complex that we're say is A. And here we have some sort of complex B. Um, so, I mean, if you want to calculate, if you want to calculate um, the homology of this, you're looking at H star of the morphism space from complex A to B with differential defined by, um, defining the differential on a map F, right? So that's boundary F is going to be F composed with the boundary on A plus boundary B composed with F. And you're taking homology with respect to, to this differential. Um, and if you have large complexes, that is hard to do by hand. So what's nice about this kind of pairing theorem is it gives you a way to sort of modularize the homology calculations across distinct components of the curves. Because I've drawn examples where there's just like one immersed curve, but you might have lots of immersed curves in the tangle invariant of a particular tangle. And then you can take them pairwise and then direct sum everything together. Um, so I am coming to about 10 till. So I think what I'll do is just kind of quickly kind of mention like the proof sketch for, um, I can't go through uh, for the proof sketch for theorem two. This kind of leaves the cosmetic crossing conjecture hanging. And I'll say one word about that at the end. Um, so the idea is that, you know, if we want to prove this, theorem two, we use our case breakdown and we have our two cases, you know, from Hanselman. Um, we have the cases that the slopes are equal to plus or minus two. And then we have the cases that they're equal to plus or minus one over Q. Let me just tell you how, how this case works for brevity. The other one's similar. Um, we're gonna be looking at uh, a tangle decomposition with plus or minus two in it. So we have uh, this, this or the reversed crossings in here. Um, find this wrong, I think. Try it again. All right, tangle. And given that one of these crossings um, is a two, we can just write out what the Barnaton invariant is directly. The chain complex is quite short. Um, Barnaton invariant, for example, for plus two is, uh, has two maps in it. D. Um, and S, and th these are graded as well. And so when you go to draw the curve for this, it's a short little curve that just kind of goes like this. Um, and then it intersects the parameterization in a few, in a few places, so parameterization, parameterization, and you get um, intersection points. All right, actually, I think I just drew minus two here, but um, this is what the curve looks like for minus two. That's what the complex looks like for plus two. And you can work that out both directly. And then the idea is you have this arbitrary tangle that you're pairing with, but because things are so modular, you can kind of deduce certain things. Um, if, you're, if you're assuming that plus two and minus two are gonna give you ultimately the same knot, then you can argue that the structure of the tangle invariant of the tangle that you're pairing with is restricted to a bunch of special components and then a rational component. And there's a lot of structure theorems about this invariant too. You can determine what the slopes of the curves are. And then once you've determined the slopes and the number of the curves, you can pin down some of them and start to investigate the gradings. And you do have to, um, it's not enough to just look at the rank or the structure, you have to use the gradings, but you can ultimately show that the Q gradings of the two knots are gonna be different, which would contradict the uh, assumption that they were giving you the same knot in the pairing. Um, that's basically the idea of it. Um, I have a lot more to say, including um, some words about the, what we say about the cosmetic crossing conjecture, but I'm aware also that I'm running out of time. So I think I'll probably stop at that point. Okay, well, let's uh, thank Alison. And uh, any questions? Yeah, um, okay, so could, let's go to this, the plus minus two case again. Uh, mm -hmm. Could we just, could you just summarize it in a couple of sentences? You're, you know, you're doing, uh, you're dividing out by the involution and now yeah. you're going to associate some invariance to the tangles. The tangles. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, what, it, we're, what we're, we're trying to basically show, I mean, what we're kind of trying to show with these tangle invariants is that 
t of plus two um, is we're, we're trying to arrive at, at, at a contradiction. So we're trying to show that t of plus two is not isotopic to t of minus two. And the way that we're going to do that is to say the Kavanaugh homology is different. Um, and it, what we actually show is they are the same, <laughs> unless you consider the gratings and that they are not Q graded isomorphic, but that they are. I see. So it's quite delicate, actually. Yeah, we do have to get it. Yeah, it's not enough to do it at rank. Um, now, okay. so I'll just ask another quick question, Duncan. So um, you're using Hanselman to just simplify what you actually have to do. Is it feasible yeah. that you could avoid Hanselman? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I It may be feasible, but I think we'd have to think carefully and um, you know, like we're using a, we're essentially using a direct calculation with the shape of plus or minus two and the shape of plus or minus one over Q. And it mm -hmm. seemed unavoidable to have like a, an actual immersed curve pic picture to look at. And so T could be arbitrary, but we needed one of them to be concrete. If we could somehow like use topological information to, to get a, a handle on the curve, like not to know that it was plus or minus two exactly, but that mm, maybe it was bounded within some range or um, something like that. Maybe we could kind of get a more general argument, but I haven't thought about trying to do it without Hanselman yet. Mm -hmm. um, it really helped to be able to have one of the curves explicit and one of them arbitrary. Arbitrary to arbitrary is kind of hard. So do you have, so your, your statement of your theorem had something if, that if these things are the same, then one of your tangles is rational. So is there some way this invariant can detect rational tangles? Um, yeah, so uh, what is the, what is the exact statement for the Kavanov one? There's, in the floor version of this, the statement is that like, it's an embedded curve if and only if it's rational. Here, if it's rational, uh, the invariant is what is called rational, but it is not necessarily embedded. It is, um, uh, it's, it's, it, it looks like, uh, it looks like um, that it's going to be kind of on the bottom half of the picture. So it doesn't encircle the special marked point at all. And um, it's a so-called rational slope. Uh, rational slope, which, looks sort of like this. This is a rational slope of length one and slope zero. So it could have a different slope. It could, it could wind around here or something like that, but it may also be immersed. But it won't go around this. There is like, it won't go around this special puncture. That's what you can say basically. Right, okay. I mean, so who's, I mean, whose theorem is it that this, Invariant detects rational tangles. Um, that's going to be in. That's not mine. Um, oh. For Kavanaugh homology, that's going to probably be part of the Kotelsky, Lidman, and Watson long paper on immersed curves. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, I don't think I can quote an exact if and only if statement for you in the moment. But sure, that's that's fine. Um, that's fine. Okay. There's also a split. Okay, so we also have not rational tangle detection, but split tangle detection, which is similar, right? Because I think you probably, you know, if you want to take a rational tangle and connect some something into one of the strands, it's basically still a rational tangle. It's a split tangle. So we did actually work out a split tangle detection statement in this current article, okay. um, and the statement on the split tangle detection, because you you might want you might end up like duplicating some curves in a way. Um, the split the split tangle statement is is um is a bit wordy, but it basically says that um it says something like this. Uh, if you parameterize things so it's horizontally split, like just kind of put, add twists to your tangle until it's horizontally split, and T horizontally split is equivalent to any of these statements. So it's the following are equivalent: the Barnaton invariant of T um, is either this complex or this complex. De, uh, um, de of T 
or the cone on that, that one of T, this is just like Kotelsky, Lindman and Watson's like um, repackaging of the Bonneton invariant and the Kamano invariant has no generator circle. And what that means is that the curve is contained in the bottom half. So like you have this and this and this and your parameterization, your parameterization says that if you are gonna intersect up here, it would have a white generator. Um, and if you intersect down here, you have a black generator. So this basically says that um, whatever's happening is con contained down here. Um, there's also the statement that you're rational, you're rational, you're gonna have a rational component. Um, so there's no special. And the rational component, um, I, I think is R10. <laughs> um, when, once you parameterize it to be horizontally split, it really makes that slope zero. So it is stronger than what I was mumbling before about rational tangle detection. I just can't quite remember um, like which statement, which of these statements holds strictly for rational not like split. Like if you don't allow for connect summing and things into the tangles because this is handling a tangle that looks like something tied in, something tied in. Yeah, and so this is the statement that's in our paper, this um, horizontally split detection statement. Um, and the proof of that goes through Lidman, uh, not Lidman, um, Kotelsky, uh, Kotelsky and Watson and Zabrobius prior work. And also it uses uh, Zia's annular Kamano homology. Um, this stuff about the Barnaton invariant says that the annular Kamano homology is going to be in grading zero. And that means that the annular closure is contained in a ball, which makes it split and yeah. So there's kind of a lot to say about that. So there, I think this is maybe the statement that, that you were asking for. Yeah, I was just uh, surprised to hear that this invariant can detect something, something like that. But, okay, yeah. Uh, any any questions? Any other further questions? Yeah, maybe I'll ask one. Um, you know, the previous work on these questions actually dealt with invariants of the surge in manifolds and showing they they were different. And so, in your setup for uh, strongly invertible, you could do something like like if it's a hyperbolic, only finitely many strong inversions, and so you get finitely many tangle, you know, mm. pushing out. Like characterizing them and characterizing yeah, and the, the shape of the curve. Oh, yeah. that, that tuple, the Kovanov homology of each of those things, that would be an invariant of the <laughs> manifold. And well, I don't know, I'm just talking off the top of my head, but you know, I, I you just wonder, would that uh, be a complete characterization of, uh, you know, surgeries on these manifolds? And I, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I don't no, know, but that sounds like a good thing to think about. Yeah. And I, I, I guess as well, what about the cosmetic crossing uh, conjecture? Uh, <laughs> yes. So we tried to take a stab at this too. Um, and we kind of showed a sort of general, generalized asymptotic cosmetic crossing conjecture. So we, we kind of showed that if you have um, that if you're like adding twists to a band and you add enough twists that the, the knots will always be um, just distinct from each other. But we weren't able to show it for like adding no twists and two twists, you know, which is the crossing change. So it, it was like over, like for a high enough number, like um, adding, yes. adding twists will produce distinct knots is basically what we showed. We showed and an similarly like calculate their Kavan homology and show that if you consider Q gradings too, that they'll be different as Q graded vector spaces, um, and we 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 kind of re, we were reproving a result of Wang's that was like that. That was well, we re, we reproved a different result of Wang's. Wang's Wang said if you had a split, if you have a split link and you do a band surgery on it, then you can add twist to the band, and you will get different knots. I think for the cosmetic crossing conjecture, you don't want to assume you have a split link. You just want to do like, you just want to take any any link. Mm -hmm. and then add a band to it. Um, so we were able to reprove Wang's result using immersed curves instead of using like skein triples. Yeah. He also used Gavana homology, but he did it with his, his skein argument. 
Right, I mean, that sounds like a souped up version of something that Matt Hedden and Liam did at some point when they were constructing infinitely many knots, distinct knots with the same uh, knot fleur homology. Yes, it's it's similar. It's similar in flavor to that kind of stuff. Although they were using a skein argument as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that result is is um, very familiar to me because I had to um, use parts of it in my thesis work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah. If I remember, they first they used the Jones polynomial and note that if you had a Jones polynomial one knot, then you'd have a problem. And so they went to Kavanaugh homology instead. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's uh, thank, thank uh, Alison again. Thanks for inviting me. It's, uh, I wish I could be in real Montreal. <laughs>